rom- modern romance is, sure. is getting is doing uh, really great stuff. A lot of it is doing really great stuff with consent and and healthy relationships. Um, I'm thinking more about like m- mainstream media and and honestly, a lot of the way, uh, not everybody, but uh, frequently you see uh, relationships handled. I'm like that is that is stalking. And that is not romantic. <laughs> That's actually a crime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. should have said too, like you've just you broken don't... into someone's home to watch them sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. He's a vampire anyway, so like you know, it's whatever. totally fine. I... The number yeah, of vampires yeah. who do this, I'm just like, <laughs> dudes. <laughs> Hello, 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 my friends. I'm Nicholas W. Fuller. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host for Person Behind the Pages, the show where we get to know the authors and creators that make the things we love. Today, I have an amazing guest that I'm so happy to get to speak with, Mary Robinette Koa. Hi, Mary Robinette. Hello. Good to see you, Nicholas. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. So if you don't know Mary Robinette Koa, she's amazing, like I said. Let's run through the list. She's a science fiction author of both novels and short stories who has won just about every award you can as a science fiction author. She's the former president of Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association. She's the long-running co-host of the excellent writing advice podcast, Writing Excuses. She's an audiobook narrator, an interview of interesting experts that she shares on her Patreon, cultivator of the kindest corner of the internet, former professional puppeteer good enough to have performed on Sesame Street, and she's taught her cat how to talk? Like, Mary Robinette. All I can say is, wow. <laughs> uh, thank you. You make me sound very shiny. I appreciate that. You are quite shiny in my eyes. So let's jump right into questions. As someone who is a parent, I have to ask, why in the world would you want to give your sweet pets the ability to talk back to you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, and one I ask myself often. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it reduces problematic behavior. Um, Does it? Okay. Yeah. So, um, and and it is enriching. Um, so for folks who don't know, what we're talking about <laughs> is, um, it's called augmentative interspecies communication. Uh, my cat, Elsie, and I are enrolled in a study. Um, this field was pioneered in 2019, or, or popularized maybe, by a woman named Christina Hunger, who's a speech and language therapist. And she thought, what happens if I use the same techniques that I use for my nonverbal patients with my new puppy? Um, and the answer is, uh, her Chaos. dog has a, <laughs> yeah, basically, 60 <laughs> word vocabulary or 60 to 80 word vocabulary. Wow. She spawned an international movement. Um, there are 3,000 animals enrolled in the study that Elsie and I are enrolled in, wow. which is the largest language acquisition study ever done with animals. Like previously, it was like one gorilla for 20 years or one parrot for 20 years, and now it's thousands of animals. So they're getting to see different patterns and consistencies. Um, but the thing with Elsie is, you know, if you've got a, if those of you who have cats, um, how your cat clearly wants to play. And you bring out a toy, and it is the wrong toy, and they look at you with <laughs> such disdain. Um, that moment is completely gone, because now she can tell me what toy she wants to play with, and we just play with that toy. Um, she doesn't climb on furniture uh, to get my attention anymore. Um, mostly doesn't bite my ankles. Every now and then she is uh, trying to get my attention when I am when I cannot pay attention to her. Sure. Um, but like when I'm uh, audiobook narrating, I can tell her that I am uh, Mary Robinette talk working now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Elsie, quiet, sleepy, uh, when all done talk working, then play. And she will curl up in the studio and go to sleep. Whereas before she would rattle around and I would have to like lock her up in some weird place. Yeah. Um, we don't have a small apartment, so there's not a lot of places to lock her. I thought I'd have to lock my dogs in the bathroom right now, but so far they're chill. We'll see. Yeah. Um, When you, when you, when you talk to your cat, do you just talk or do you press mm -hmm. the buttons too? Both. And it depends. Like if, uh, when she came in here in the studio, because I don't have buttons in here, um, I just talk to her. When I'm out there, I tend to talk and press the buttons. It's called modeling and Mm -hmm. it helps Mm -hmm. her 
um, it helps her link connections in her in her brain um, between button and word, as well as a uh, kind of concept. Um, so, so when I'm out there, if, like if we are, um, if we're if we're having a conversation, which I view as an enrichment activity, I mm-hmm. sit on the floor next to her button board and, and press buttons and, and she presses buttons. Um, if I am at the kitchen counter and I'm cooking and she's asking me to play, I just do it with the voice. That's awesome. I didn't yeah. like, I mean, I knew that you do this, of course, but because uh, I follow you on social media and it's fun to watch. But I, I didn't know that this is kind of like a citizen science. You're part of a study. Mm-hmm. How do you report some of your, like, what, what do you report to the whoever's running the study? Um, so Elsie is in, there's three phases. Uh, Elsie and I are in phase one. Um, and part of that is, uh, and that's basically uh, that you just report button presses, uh, and you have video available if they want to look at it. So Elsie has a camera that's running, 20, she has two cameras actually, that are running 24-7 on her board. But then we also, um, the but, it logs it. Oops, mm-hmm. sorry, you can definitely see the ring light there. So um, so those are the button presses that she's making. Wow. Um, and so uh, so they, they get instant access to that data uh, about what she's pressing. Um, and like uh, I, I have to go in and, and update it to oops, mm-hmm. there we go to say that it was me that pressed those buttons, um, mm-hmm. but you can see where I model for her as we're having a, a little bit of a conversation. Um, That's so, so cool. It's really cool, uh, and you see all sorts of patterns um, that that I love the logging of it. Initially, you were doing it all by hand, uh, or like just logging it on uh, sure. spreadsheets. So this this automatic logging is a huge improvement, um, but yeah, it's it's fascinating. I love like citizen science stuff. My wife is yeah. in marine biology and getting into like different sort of citizen science programs. It's super neat. So yeah. You're clearly an animal lover. In fact, one of your recent books, I think your most recent, The Spare Man, features mm-hmm. a little doggy. Yes. So what was it like writing Little Doggy and how much of your own pets were uh, were in <laughs> Little Doggy? Um, so Gimlet is a Westie and uh, she's named after and modeled on a real dog named Gimlet that belongs to my friend Eileen Cook, who's a fantastic writer. Um, and so I gave my fictional Gimlet some of that fairly bratty Westy personality, like, or at least this particular one is very opinionated. She's so sweet, but super opinionated. <laughs> and, um, and then my mom has a service dog. And so I modeled, uh, all of her service dog and the interactions, uh, with my mom's dog. Uh, for instance, my mom's dog has a command that a lot of service dogs don't have, which is go say hi. Um, and that tells the dog that even though they are on duty, that they are allowed to approach someone and receive pets. Um, and part of that is that my mom, uh, he's a stability dog. So Gimlet is also based on my mom's service dog. Uh, Captain is a stability dog, so he has an unusual command for service dogs, which is go say hi, mm-hmm. which tells him that even though he's on duty, he's allowed to approach someone to, to receive pets. And the reason he has that is because as a stability dog, once he gets her to her place, he doesn't actually have much to do. He's just kind of hanging out and he's being a dog. And um, mom likes it when people pay attention to him instead of noting her uh, because the Parkinson's can be, Mm. she she doesn't like people staring at the Parkinson's. Um, So I I gave that that particular command to Gimlet. and Captain, like, enjoys doing his job. Uh, so I, I wanted to give that to Gimlet as well. So those those things. And then I um, worked with a, uh, a sensitivity reader slash uh, uh, expert reader on, uh, subject matter expert on um, PTSD dogs. Uh, mm. And Jordan Corella read specifically for that and talked about the specific behaviors that a PTSD dog would do. So three different dogs. Yeah. So different research went into it. Yeah. And that's awesome. So 
on this show, I talk with a wide variety of people from people who are like just starting kind of their creative work to people like you who are, you know, doing creative things full time. So I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, especially since you're doing it full time, what is like your daily routine like and, and does it change at kind of different like I'll call them seasons, whether you're drafting or editing or maybe working on audiobooks or, you know, how does that work for you? Yeah. Um, you used a word in there that I don't recognize. Routine? <laughs> <laughs> fair fair okay all right um, so. <laughs> so um so i uh the thing about being a creative mm -hmm. person you know mm -hmm. someone who's who's making their living at it is that you're a freelancer which means mm -hmm. that you're juggling multiple deadlines uh because you have multiple income streams so um, like with my Patreon, I teach a class once a month. Um, so that means that in the evening, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to teach, which means that during the day, I try to give myself some time off. Um, but on another day, like I will get up and go to the coffee shop and work for several hours if, uh, writing, um, or maybe I'm traveling and there is no coffee shop for me to go to. Um, or, uh, or it's raining and I just don't feel like walking. Um, I aforementioned, uh, my mom has Parkinson's. So my husband and I, um, live in an apartment that is above them. And that means that I'm often getting up and going downstairs to take care of her. So what I try to do is, um, look at what my end goal is. Uh, so let's say, okay, I want to have this novel written in, you know, this amount of time. That means that um, in order to have it written by then, I'm going to need to actually start writing. You know, it's, I know it's going to be this long, which means it's going to take, you know, however many months, let's say seven months to draft, uh, to have a, a completed know. draft. So that means that then if I want to that gives me my starting date and then I have to back up and figure out, okay, and that means that I have to have outline by this time and between starting date and turning in about how many words do I need to be doing. So I, I do it much more on um, uh, tent posts, uh, milestones, and then each week I sit down and figure out what that particular week looks like. And every morning when I get up, I figure out what that particular day looks like. Uh, so... This morning, um, I got up, it's cool outside, and we don't have the smoke that everyone else has right now. So um, I took my computer and I sat on the patio um, with my feet up on the lounge and uh, worked on catching up on email because I just turned in a, the draft of a novel and I have to resist touching it um, until, I, until I get editorial notes back. It's very hard. Um, <laughs> so I was catching up on email. Um, and then, uh, when it started to warm up, I came inside and switched over to editing a video for, um, I'm starting to do some asynchronous classes, uh, in addition to the live classes on Patreon. So editing that video, uh, then lunch and now I'm here. Uh, and then after mm -hmm. this, uh, after this, I will probably return to editing um and uh and then do that for a little while and then switch to translation because i'm translating a novel out of icelandic and then i try to be done with my work day um by around six o'clock so that i can um spend time with you know family and, and do fun things um <laughs> mixed in with that i'm gonna go for walks with uh guppy who is um who is, uh, she's a show dog. Uh, she just showed up. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, she's relatively new in our lives. Um, so I'll probably go for a walk with her. I'll probably sit down with Elsie and uh, play or, or have a conversation with her, which is also a form of play. Um, so that's like, there is no routine. Every day is completely yeah. different. That's super interesting to me, though, that you actually, you, you kind of don't really plan your day until, like, the day of. Sometimes I do that, but I, 
not for me. I try to avoid that because I feel like I'm way more efficient if I like have an idea of what I'm coming into. But, but I also love that you write in a coffee shop because I think that's kind of fun and like, that's neat. Um, yeah. So I will time block uh, on my calendar mm-hmm. to keep uh, to keep windows open and for writing. Um, and when I say plan the day, like um, there's the um, there there are all of the things that are set schedule items, like meet Nicholas Fuller at one o'clock, um, my time, and. Uh, but then there's the list of to-do items. Uh, so I do time block. So I'll put blocks on my calendar to hold them open for writing or editing to keep people from scheduling meetings on. So when I'm talking about I decide what my day looks like day of, um, what I do is like the night before, I make a list of, okay, here are the places that I have to be. Um, you know, so like Nicholas Fuller, one o'clock. Um, and then uh, I, I also make notes about, you know, it's like you're planning to edit from 10 to 12. Um, so then when I get up in the morning, what I'm doing is figuring out what the rest of that day looks like. So I take mm. my to-do list and figure out what time I'm actually doing the thing that day. And the reason I do it for that is because I have um, uh, depression and ADHD. Um, and my um let me say my brain is unreliable sometimes <laughs> so uh so getting in and figuring out okay this is this is what i actually have the energy for um here are the things that i need to do this is the order in which i'm going to do them oh and look if i'm planning on uh you know answering all of these emails, then uh, this one spot in my schedule is when I can do it. And if you don't do it, then so so what I do is I write a timeline for myself so that as I go through the day, I don't have to deal with I only have to deal with the executive function dump once in the morning when I'm fresh. Um, And otherwise, the ADHD executive function for me is one of the big problems making the decision of what's the next thing to go to. So that's, that's why I do it that particular way. Yeah, so smart. One, like I get sucked into the email black hole way more often than I want to. And two, my son has ADHD. So I, uh, ha- I feel like I understand a piece of the unreliable brain. I am his executive functioning in the morning that gets him on the bus, you know. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So um, you know, you, you, yeah, I'm impressed though, that you're able to write a book at all, <laughs> to be honest, like, because like, you know, with my son's like ADHD, it's such a big project. Like I can't imagine, you know, but so, um, so I'm late diagnosis with ADHD. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, so many things in hindsight are so much clearer about the way I've structured my entire life. But Mm-hmm. Uh, there are four basic things that will trigger hyper focus, and so mm-hmm. the challenge is just triggering the hyper focus on the novel. Uh, now that nice. I know it's ADHD, I yeah. have been working on um, reliably, reliably ish, <laughs> uh, turning uh, turning hyper focus on and off. Um, so that I'm picking the right hyperfocus thing and also recognizing when I'm starting to hyperfocus on the wrong thing. So the four things um, that seem to be across folks are uh, novel, that it's new and interesting, or that it's new, um, urgent, um, challenging, and uh, interesting. So it's one of the reasons that NaNoWriMo works really well for me because it's brand new, starting literally a new novel. It's novel. Um, It's interesting. It's a topic I want to do. It's challenging because you've got, you know, 30 days, 50,000 words. um, Yeah. And uh, and then and then it's also urgent because if you aren't hitting those deadlines, you're you're in trouble. So um, I spent, you know, my life in theater every Every time you finish a show, you move on to the next show. So it's again, new, interesting, challenging, urgent. Um, 
So the the trick with a novel is to not think of it as a giant task, but think of it as an opportunity for hyper focus. There you go. There you go. Um, but you, yeah, you you don't write serialized books. You you don't have like the same characters for every single book that you write, but you do have some recurring themes and elements in your stories like uh, characters and healthy committed relationships, right? So can you talk about uh, some of those recurring themes and elements that are in all your different works, the way that you've kind of branded yourself, your works that way? Sure. Um, so I do like uh, the Glamorous Histories um, is it does follow the same pair of characters all the way through, but each book sure. theoretically stands as a stand works as a standalone. Part of the reason that I do that happily married couples is because um, we don't see them modeled in fiction very much. A lot of people are learning their idea of what a relationship looks like from mm. books, TV, media, uh, in which the relationships are wildly dysfunctional because people think that's how you establish conflict and drama. And um, anyone who is married and in a happily committed relationship knows that you can still have conflict and drama. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't have to come from within the relationship. And even, even you know, like, uh, like when we have arguments about... Um, you know, who's who's going to take the garbage out? We do not have arguments about this, but um, it it's never actually about who's going to take the garbage out. It's always about something else. Mm -hmm. And and it manifests as as being about the garbage. So um, so when I'm creating the characters uh, for for doing doing this, I think of it as the relationship is a character itself and that 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 character of the relationship is going to grow and evolve over time. Um, and it will have some interior conflict, but mostly uh, it's going to be dealing with exterior conflict, which is going to put uh, pressure on different aspects of self. And those different aspects of self are the two individuals who are in that relationship. It sounds very complicated when I describe it that way. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, I think that makes sense, though. Basically, uh, my characters assume that the other one is operating in good faith and uh, and they have healthy communication. That's basically what I'm doing, though. No, oh, that's great. And I love the idea that, yeah, you know, having healthy relationships in media is a good thing. We should have more of that. Mm -hmm. And there's so much, yeah, like uh, so many romance stories are just about the coming together, which is kind of fun, but like yeah. very few of them talk about the staying together, which is a lot of mm -hmm. work, you know? Yeah. yeah a so lot that's... of work and, and a lot of where the interesting stuff happens. Um, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of, and this is not romance, like rom modern romance is, sure. is getting, is doing uh, really great stuff. A lot of it is doing really great stuff with consent and, and healthy relationships. Um, I'm thinking more about like, mainstream media and and honestly a lot of the way uh, not everybody but uh frequently you see uh relationships handled i'm like that is that is stalking and that is not romantic <laughs> that's actually a crime yeah 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 i just yeah. should have said too like you've just you broken don't... into someone's home to watch them sleep <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. He's a vampire anyway. So like, you know, it's whatever. totally fine. Like, the number yeah, of vampires yeah. who do this. I'm just like, <laughs> dudes, I, I never understand. Why do they choose to be in high? Can you imagine being like a hundred something years old and being like, you know what? I'm going to do <laughs> high, high school. school. High school again. sounds great. That's where I want to be. Let's, let's sign me up. All right. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. <laughs> and yeah, I should have, yeah. let me correct myself. I should have said you don't, only write like serialized stuff like someone like a like a clive cussler that like virtually oh, yeah, yeah. only wrote dirk pitt novels you know but anyway sure. um yeah so i mentioned at the top that you're a uh, co-host of the awesome writing excuses podcast and your mm -hmm. fellow co-host uh howard taylor has said that when you were first on writing excuses you talked about what you can learn from puppets about storytelling and you blew them all away he says right so can you talk about what uh, – we'll get into puppets a little bit. I want to – that's kind of segueing into puppets. But, um, in fact, let's talk about puppets first. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, how, uh, how much time did you spend with puppets first and foremost? 
<laughs> that sounds um, funny phrased I, that way, but yeah, I know. Um, I had about a twenty-year career doing that, um, That's and amazing. that was my primary source of income for uh, for the bulk of that. It was really only the last five of it that it switched over to be more writing. Um, and depending on how you can, like I could say a oh, twenty-five year career, but really, like my last five years, um, the la I've done almost no pu puppetry. Um, a, a little bit here and there, just enough to keep my hand in. <laughs> so you've uh, you professional puppetry. You even performed on Sesame Street. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was that was so fantastic. Um, I mean, so, so I've done um, Sesame in two different incarnations. I did the film Elmo and Grouchland, and then uh, got to do two days uh, on the the TV show. And it's like say the difference between saying uh, I was on X Files the TV show and X Files the movie. It's like one of them is significantly cooler. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, so on Sesame Street, I have played um, a piece of pizza on a stick and a bluebird. Um, I've been a bag of garbage. Um, I, I also do uh, right hands. Um, so uh, so when, a, when you've got a, a live hand puppet like um, Ernie, Cookie Monster, um, Oscar, you've got two puppeteers, one who's got their hand in the puppet's head and their left hand in the puppet's head. Um, so they're, you know, me trying to stay okay. in frame and do this. And then you so they're doing right. that. You know, hello. Hi. Yeah. Um, so they're doing that. And then somebody else is coming around and doing the right hand. So uh, this is why most puppets are left-handed. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Uh. Um, <laughs> That makes so much sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then sometimes you need the two hands to be very coordinated, like if they're handling mm -hmm. something. So you, uh, the second puppeteer does both hands. Uh, so I also worked on a show called Lazy Town. And, um, and again, I was a, uh, an assistant puppeteer, a background puppeteer, a second. There's a lot of different names for it. But I did uh, that one. That show was very uh, sports heavy. And so I did a lot of sports with my hands like totally over my head my head ducked down to there's a television monitor so that i'm seeing what the camera is seeing it's a lot of fun but it's it's a weird job yeah <laughs> i can only imagine yeah being like the one arm of the puppet and i'm sure yeah. you have to be kind of close to the other puppeteer right like yes personal space is not an option for, for no, no, and especially hygiene. too, like when there, how many how many different montages the Sesame Street has where there's like you know twenty different puppets all on on camera. I'm yeah. Sure. yeah, again, yeah, and probably all on top of each books. other, right? Yeah, yep, yes, it's that's so cool credible. though. Yeah, as a parent we, of a uh, two year old, like I mean, like she, you know, someday I'm gonna like point back to this and be like, you know, like you love Sesame Street. I talked with the pizza on a stick. <laughs> Which okay, like okay. I mean that's actually cool, man. I mean you know there's you know, yeah, there's lots of little look, like vegetables look, and whatever. It's so it's so cool. Yeah, I had to. My job was to uh, someone threw a slice of pizza, and my job was to hit Grover in the face and then drop to the floor. And so you have to think about you know like what are the physics, the inertial arc, and then the <laughs> cohesion of the mozzarella on monster food. Yeah. How long do I cling before I drop? Like. <laughs> yeah. you just imagine. that's awesome how many like did, was that a bunch of takes for that or do they did yeah it was the, because there i mean there, there were other things happening in the shot so we did i don't know uh so we did i don't know uh four or five takes to to get it but as i it was, i was not the only thing that was going on in the shot so there was a lot of a lot sure. of stuff um the bulk of my career has been on stage but um I will do film and television any chance I get because uh, it pays really well. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, is that? Yeah. What a like. So my, I have a very limited knowledge of puppetry. It's not my world, you know. So like mm -hmm. I I can like talk to me about like just what different shows there are out there for puppetry on stage. I can think of like Lion King and that sort of thing. Are they like what else? 
Um, so Lion King, Little Shop of Horrors, um, okay. on, on Broadway right now, it's a war horse. If we're talking stuff for adults, uh, they did uh, King Kong. Um, uh, right now there's a really great uh, a whole bunch of puppetry in um, uh, Into the Woods. Uh, but mostly what I was doing was for, for, uh, for kids. What, yeah. what puppets they're, they're, are in Into the Woods? Milky White. Oh, of the course. Of, yes, 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 yes. Um, okay. Yeah, and the new touring production actually uses the puppet uses puppets also for the uh, the hen that lays the golden eggs, the birds that come to uh, Cinderella, and then they have these fantastic. We just saw my niece and I just saw the the current touring production, um, and they have uh, the giant. Uh, a giant, the giant appears on stage just as a pair of boots. Each boot is as tall as a person and operated by a puppeteer. Um, they're wicker, they're fantastic. It's really, really gorgeous work. Wow, that sounds super cool. So you, yeah, you I did, I know, that, super cool that you've done so much uh, puppetry for kids. Big Sesame Street fan because my two year old so appreciate it. But you mentioned you've done some stuff for adults. So you know, the the puppetry world not always so squeaky clean family friendly all the time. Definitely not. I mean, Avenue Q, Little Shop of Horrors, yeah. uh, Alien, Big Old Puppet Show. <laughs> <laughs> Big Old Puppet Show. That's funny. Uh, but I guess, you know, sometimes there's opportunities for jokes between, I guess, you and other puppeteers, that sort of thing as well. <laughs> um, one of the things that I miss most, actually, about uh, not performing anymore, um, I mean, I miss not I, I miss the performance, but a side effect of the performance was talking about things that had happened just in my, my normal day as a puppeteer that sound incredible incredibly dirty um <laughs> like uh, i had a director shout to me across the set of a children's television show come on cream it cream it now give me a good cherry um, <laughs> i was making a cherry cream pie uh yeah, it was yeah um yeah give me a long rod make sure it's inserted really deep um <laughs> oh my <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> it just—it's a rod. Yeah, what gets to... your mind out of the gutter? Come on, right? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. I used to double rod things all the time. <laughs> oh my god. Oh boy. Turns oh boy. out uh, that if you're having a hard time extracting your hand um, on a regular basis, talc, talcum is is really good for for that. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> That's too funny. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's, so we, I mentioned writing excuses. <laughs> Howard Taylor said that you were um, brilliant and, and you talked about, um, you know, using puppetry, what we can learn from puppetry for telling stories, um, which has been awesome. And I feel like I've already learned something about puppets, but, but can you talk a, a bit instead about like, um, what has it been like? Because you've been doing writing excuses for years. So how has it kind of been doing th that show for, for a while now? And what's kind of changed? I know you're the, the main cast is kind of different with this current season, right? So what else has kind of yeah. changed and what's evolved? And what are some of your favorite things about writing excuses? Um, so I, it is one of the, the big spots of joy in my life is recording those. Um, so when I started doing it, we would we were recording in Brandon's basement, and we would all sit down mm -hmm. uh, before, like we would sit down. We've got our microphones. And we're like, okay, so what are we going to talk about? And we would kind of <laughs> toss some ideas around while we were sitting in the room, and then we'd record an episode. Sometimes we were like, okay, and, and now the next episode, what are we going to talk about? Uh, sometimes we would like come up with a couple of topics right in a row. Um, then we had a year where um, Dan was going to be gone for the entire year, so we recorded all 52 episodes in a three-day period, which we will never do wow. again. Yeah, you can, you can hear us get 
progressively more punchy um, as as the season goes. Um, Batching seems and, good, but that seems like too much of a good thing. <laughs> yeah, no, that was it was not a good plan. Um, yeah. it, it was necessary, but it was not a good plan. So, uh, so that we we thought up the curriculum, all of the curriculum ahead of time. Then we started doing um, we started doing season long curriculum where we thought of it ahead of time. Then we did uh, one of the things, and I love I love the guys so much, but um, when they started the podcast, they were like, this is such a diverse podcast because we have <laughs> a science fiction writer and a horror writer and a, a fantasy writer um, who were all three white Mormon guys who lived within about <laughs> three miles of each other. And... Um, and so they knew that they wanted to diversify the cast. Uh, they brought me on. I am still white. And uh, <laughs> we wanted to diversify it further. So what we started doing was splitting the cast up because none of us wanted to quit. Um, so we, would, we had the core cast, which was the four of us. And then we would do um, two, um, like uh, we had the, what we called the Chicago cast. So Brandon would fly to Chicago and we would bring two other hosts in. Um, and then we would record the entire season, but those hosts would only appear like in two episodes a month or one or two episodes a month. Um, and then we had the Utah cast where we would fly some one person in to join uh, the, the Utah contingent. Um, and then uh, and then we switched to doing master classes, which we've done the last two years, where one we'd bring in a guest who would just do um, like eight episodes with us. And uh, and in this season, um, Brandon has stepped back. Uh, he's he's definitely he's retired uh, emeritus. And um, so we have two new hosts who are both long term friends of the podcast and have appeared on it multiple times, Aaron Roberts and Dong Won Song. And, um, and now what we are doing is back to a rhythm that was similar to what we were doing before, um, before we started playing with a lot of different guest hosts, which is that we are batching them and we meet about four times a year, four or five times a year. Um, and uh, record episodes. The um, and it definitely doesn't feel like you are all getting together immediately before recording, going like, "What are we going to talk about?" No, no, <laughs> we we're, uh, we're planning. Yeah, yeah. Now we we've been doing the planning for a while, and so this season, the two big things that have happened are that we um, the the new hosts, um, so a new core cast. And then we also hired a producer for the first time. <laughs> We've been recording for 18 year, 18 seasons, uh, and we yeah. just just got a producer. Um, so Emma Emma Reynolds is great, and she we do um, a monthly meeting to just kind of keep the business of writing excuses moving forward. Um, like we're trying to do stuff with our Patreon, which we've had but haven't done anything with. So now we're actually doing things. It's shocking. And then, um, and then right before the week before we record, uh, we have a meeting where we run through what our curriculum is going to be, and then uh, and then we all meet up and record. Uh, we re prefer to record in person. Um, we were recording remotely during the pandemic, and we will do it if we have a deadline that we need to. But uh, the podcast is fundamentally different when we are recording in person than than when it's rec um, uh, Zoom or, or some other interface. That makes sense. I'd love to. I'd love to someday do like this kind of show, but more of like this, like a, I call it the Graham Norton style where he's, mm -hmm. he's a British talk show host and like he brings yeah. out all his guests at once and like there's this fun interplay between guests. But I don't think it would work if I'm doing it virtual because, you know, the... So, yeah, I mean, maybe someday I could do some of that, maybe a convention or something. But I hear yeah. you. I, I could totally get why you prefer in person. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's it's better. So, and you guys also do riding retreats, both on land mm -hmm. and on sea with the cruise ship, uh, yep. which sounds like goals to me. That would be amazing. Uh, any kind That's of standout memories from from 
any of the conferences? Oh, golly. Um, it's a doozy. Yeah, no, there's so many. Um, so the the one we just did, which was land-based, was um, geared at giving writers the the tools to be able to write horses and um, and uh, falconry uh, well. So um, so yeah, we we were jokingly calling yeah. it writing excuses, and ah. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things that I remember really distinctly was that one of the um, one of the writers had um, it was a couple of them had had bad experiences with horses and watching them talk about the fact that they had gotten onto the horse and that they had ridden the horse and that um, that nothing bad had happened and you could see that confidence um, starting to manifest in the ways they were talking about the next writing project. And, um, and that was really cool to see, uh, on the cruises, um, we've, we've had, uh, people who have, um, met and fallen in love on the cruise, which is not why you come on the cruise, but it's really cool. Um, we actually had a wedding, um, <laughs> and, uh, wow. And then the the other thing that happens um, in all of them is that we get at least one person who says, and usually more than one person, but at least one who says some variation of, I haven't written in months or years and I started writing again because I was on this. Or I got more words written on this than I have, you know, I've been blocked and I've been in a slump and it's been a slog and suddenly I'm writing. Uh, the, the relationships that the students build between each other is, um, I think, more valuable than anything we can teach them. That's nice. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I have to confess that you're my favorite writing instructor on writing excuses. I do like all the other co-hosts, but like for me, your uh, writing advice always like resonates the most with me. So, so listeners, I'll say, like, if you ever read my writing and you like it, it's Mary Robinette's work. And if you don't, it's because <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to use her tools correctly. But, <laughs> but so I did sign up for your Patreon writing courses. And I really like that because you have that in addition to everything that you guys offer with writing excuses. And on those Patreon writing ex courses, you have your own more in-depth writing lessons and an opportunity for like live questions and answers with mm -hmm. you. Um, how is that Patreon for anyone that's like thinking of that? How is that the, the Patreon a bit of like a value add over just listening to the Writing Excuses podcast? Um, so with writing is the the podcast. Um, you know, we joke that it, the the tagline is fifteen minutes long because you're in a hurry and we're not that smart. And usually we we are running like twenty twenty five minutes, honestly. But. Um, but with the the teaching, I can get more in depth, and um, and especially if you are able to actually attend the live class, you can ask me to unpack it for you. Um, we're starting to do uh, live Q and A's and um, homework assignments for the Writing Excuses podcast as well, uh, but we've just started to do those. The, that's um, this is, I think, the second month that we're doing it, but it's mostly that um, it's it's mostly being able to ask questions directly, um, and then again, uh, the community. There's a um, there's a, a Discord community. With the a, kindest with corner on the internet, right? Kindest corner on the internet of the internet, yeah. and um, and it really is. Everybody is kind. Uh, we've we've worked hard at modeling that as a community, and so when you go in and you're like, I am struggling with this story, and people will say, Do you want to vent? Do you need a safe space to vent, or are you looking for um, for for advice? And uh, in the writing channel, people will be like, Advice, <laughs> usually. <laughs> um, and frequently, I will see something pop up, and I get in there, and somebody has already answered it. Uh, either with exactly what I would say or something that's better. 
Um, so it's the again, community. I think is one of the most value, the biggest value adds. Love that. Let, perfect segue into my next question too. So when I wrote my first book, which is a trunk book, but it was eleven years ago, I found the whole process super isolating. Now that I'm taking like a second crack at writing, I found community, not only through like your podcast and kind of, you know, I can listen to writing excuses while I'm coming back from dropping my daughter off at daycare. And I'm like, oh, great. I get to like listen to Dan and Brandon and Mary Robinette again, you know, uh, but also, um, you know, I've set up uh, an in-person writing group, which is super helpful for oh, me. It's great. nice to do that. Right. Um, so I feel like community is so important and I definitely feel like you agree. Um can you talk about how community and peer support is part of your process? And then also, well, this might even be a separate question, but as a, as a former president of CIFWA, the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers Association, how is community at that scale helpful for people? Sure. So, um, so in my own personal process, um, I think because I come out of theater, it's difficult for me to write without feedback. Hmm. And so as I am writing a novel, I will um, I will post chapters as I go. I try to stay about three chapters ahead of my readers, and that allows me to see how they're responding and uh, and adjust the story based on those responses. Um, and that that's incredibly helpful for me. It's uh, it's. It lets me see if it's actually playing. Like I tell people, don't worry about right. language. If I'm, you know, the, everyone's getting very rough first drafts. Um, I often leave the placeholder. I used to take the placeholders out before I gave it to the beta readers, and now I'm leaving them in because it turns out that um, it is helpful for people to see how raw my first drafts are uh, in terms of what yeah. they're allowed to do with their own first drafts. Um, and then I am um, with Sifwa. Uh, the the thing that's great about that is um, the power of collective bargaining. Like we are not a union um, because of various laws in the United States that prevent us from being one. But we're still able to have conversations with short story markets to say, hey, you need to raise the minimum rate that you're paying authors. Or we're able to have conversations um, with traditional publishers and and say, you know, hey, uh, industry be best practice is to do this. And, uh, and that's something that an individual author can't do. Um, your agent sure. might be able to make a shift for you um, for clauses, you know, clauses in a contract, but um, but they aren't going to be able to uh, call you out, uh, call, call the publisher out, excuse me, they aren't going to be able to call the publisher out if there's something that they've done that's really egregious. Um, you know, if, if we've got a, we, several years ago, we had a publisher that was uh, not paying its authors and um, and Sifwa was able to step in and and fix that. Um, so so that's one of the the big things. And then the um, the Discord uh, is very very vibrant right now. And and again, a great place to go just to you know when you when you've got that thing of hi, I'm a new author and I don't know what I'm doing. Please, someone <laughs> and someone will be like, they're there, they're there. <laughs> Uh, I want to get back to collective bargaining, but briefly you talked about kind of posting your, your work. And so that's, you, you, I think you've asked for beta readers. So they're like from mm -hmm. your, your Patreon patrons, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. So. I used to put out a larger call for, um, for beta readers, but the last time I did that, um, I had like 150 people sign up for it. And Ooh, that wow. that is that is too many. <laughs> That's too much feedback. Too much feedback. That's too yeah. much feedback. So uh, so now it's it's just uh, Patreon and the Lady Astronaut Club. I might do a call to my newsletter, um, but uh, but it was it was too much. It was too much feedback. 
So check these places out. Join her Patreon and read Mary Robinette stuff early, huh? huh? Mm-hmm. Not yeah, to mention any- the community and everything else, which is awesome. Yes. But yeah, if you want, um, if you want to get your hands on things before everybody else does, and often see a draft like. Uh, there are two scenes that I cut from this, the Martian contingency, which I just turned in, uh, and my patrons are the only people who are going to get to see, or, you know, currently are the only people who got to read those scenes. That's rad. That's really cool. Um, but yeah, you mentioned collective bargaining with SIFWA, and I you know you posted on social media some time ago, at the time of our recording now, who knows that things will change, but the <laughs> WGA is still on strike, the writer's... Yeah. Writers Guild America, or mm-hmm. is it? Writers Guild of America, yeah, right, yeah. And so- um, I, I, so basically, the members of WGA. I am not a member, um, but they uh, they want to be paid fairly, and uh, they want some assurances about the use of AI. And, um, you know, at least thinking about it and having conversations and like maybe setting some regulations in place. And um, the uh, AMTP, I'm missing a letter in there, but it's the um, association of that, that handles movies and TVs from the producer side. Um, mm-hmm. They uh, they aren't. Uh, that they they are not coming back to the bargaining table, um, so uh, so Writers Guild is called a strike uh, because of my puppetry and audiobook work. I am a member of SAG-AFTRA, which is the Screen Actors Guild, and that is uh, we have authorized um, uh, authorized the our union reps to uh to call for a strike which is not the same thing as being on strike but it means that when they are at the bargaining table that they can yeah. they can say okay and that's it we're going on strike um and it, you know i'm just i'm really tired of creators whether they are writers or directors or actors being taken for granted um it's something and it seems like that, that's been been going on with like the streaming services for a while. That's another big kind of sticking point with the current strike, yeah, right? The streaming services, uh, all of the rates that were put in for streaming services for actors, writers, for the residuals, were put in when streaming s- services were um, kind of peripheral and uh, not the mainstream, and <clears throat> most work was coming through uh, broadcast television or cable television. Now everybody streams everything. Right. So um, so that, that means that a lot of people are, you know, not making a living wage anymore. So, uh, so that's, that's something that they want to change to recognize the reality of how we are. It's much the same way, you know, ebooks, ebooks aren't important for writers. <laughs> Hi, Turns Elsie. Out. Elsie up. Hello, talking kitty. Elsie. Elsie, shoulder. Come on. You're just going to yawn at me? <laughs> Cats are such divas, right? They're no, like, you might have good. ideas, but I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> there we go. Hey, hey look at that. This is Elsie. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Elsie. Nice Hi, to Elsie. see you. Elsie. High five. Oh, you oh. can do better. Come on. Elsie, high five. Thank you. Good girl. Yeah, good girl. Nice. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, you're such a good girl. Will you circle? Oh. Elsie, circle. Trying to try to get there yeah, we go. Yeah. There we go. That's it. Her work here is done. <laughs> She's, <Somewhere. laughs> <laughs> She's like She's also checking my hand to see if I have treats. <laughs> I do not. Yeah, so I did good, right? Give me a treat. Come on. Yeah. She's just getting scratches, which she also likes. No. So uh, uh yeah, this is also part of what my day is like. <laughs> right, right. 
Um, have you personally used uh, like any of the AI tools like ChatGPT? What's been yeah. your impression of them so far? My impression is that we're only a couple of years away from an AI from from AI being able to write novels. Um, mm -hmm. It'll still be guided, um, but uh, we're not far away from that. Uh, the biggest problem with them right now is uh, that it's cliched and um, absolutely no continuity at all. Um, I have used it um, for, uh, um, but not in not in situations where I would have hired someone to do the thing. Um, mm -hmm. But things where it's like, oh, I don't want to have to do this myself. Um, and like the beginning of all of the chapters of uh, Martian of the Lady Astronaut books, um, all of them start with a. Uh, um, newspaper article and I use my usual process and that's what I did for this book is that I go into the New York Times and I find an article that is comparable that has a lot of the same uh, either uh, it, it's you know it happened actually on the day that the that the chapter is set uh, but it you know and it's about a disaster and then I will I will adjust for the meteor timeline um, but then sometimes there's an article that there's really not a good match for. Um, and so this time I experimented with having ChatGPT uh, write those for me. Um, and I would tell it to give me a list of five different uh, articles about this. Uh, and the article should be no more than this many sentences or, or what have you. I'd give it some parameters. And it would spit something out that was... Uh, that was fine, um, and I have to edit it, but it was um, it was easier emotionally than easier page. than writing it. I don't think it, yeah. it didn't actually save me time, uh, but it 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 got me over the it, hump of doing it. Um, and then it when felt I'm going easier, it felt easier. Um, yeah, it it was easier in that. You know, it uh, it dealt with the part that was hard, which was making the decision to write the article. Um, <laughs> it's like, I love writing, and some days writing is just not what my brain wants to do. And um, but then when I was, it was interesting because there were several that I was like, oh, this is great, and had done a tiny bit of editing or just dropped in. But when I just did my um, my big editing pass before turning it in, I was like, oh dear lord, these are filled with repetition. Um, it's like this This just says the same thing in th three different sentences that say the same thing. Um, uh, just like all this redundancy in it. And um, so it needed a lot of editing to bring it back around. But um, knowing how these things change and how quickly we have iterated since it got introduced, I'm like, no, we're just a couple of years away just a couple of years away yeah. from being able to just spit out a whole novel. So that's super interesting that you've used it actually on your latest work. That's, that's neat. And I, I've played with it a little bit too, and I totally agree with your like assessment. It's well, it's getting better and better, but already it's kind of nice to not have to deal with the totally blank page. You can, you can, you know, have something to run from my yeah. one, f I'm in full support of the strike because it just, makes sense because things are changing and you have to have these these discussions as things are changing right uh my one fear is that like writers are going to be striking and studio execs are just going to already be like well then forget it we're going to like have chat gpt write the next episode of the mandalorian or something crazy yeah yeah um i'm sure that someone is going to try that uh i tried writing a short story uh using something called pseudo write which is supposed to be um it's designed to be to use ai t as a brainstorming partner for a writer um mm -hmm. so i was like you know what i want to try this um i think it's an interesting idea uh and so i gave it a try <laughs> uh that story is a hot mess um, yeah. Like, there is no continuity. It would, like, just introduce characters randomly and then forget other characters existed. Um, such a hot mess. 
So hopefully if they so. do take that step, the quality will be so bad that it blows up in their face. Yeah, the only, the only way that you're going to get right now, and again, I think that's going to change, the only way you're going to get usable output from it is if you have a writer who will edit it into shape or guide it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that point, you have a writer who is a scab because they are crossing the picket lines to do it. Yeah. As I said, I won't use ChatGPT to do anything that I would hire a person for. Um, sure. But I will use it to help me get past executive function problems. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably fair. Well, Mary Robinette, it's been absolutely delightful talking to you. Thank you for coming and, and talking to me and hopefully talking to our audience. Appreciate it. Thank you. This has been absolutely delightful. It's good to see you, Nicholas. Thank you. And where can people find and follow you online? And also, how do they find you on Patreon so that they can read your stuff early and get all the other wonderful benefits, including the kindest corner on the internet? The easiest thing is to go to my website, maryrobinettekowal.com. And that will have links to my newsletter. It has links to my Patreon um, and all of my social medias. Just in case, if anyone's listening podcast version, how do you spell your last name for maryrobinettekowal.com? K-O-W-A-L. Awesome. Well, again, thank you, Mary Robinette. Appreciate it. And thank you for listening. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this one. Please give me that uh, like and subscribe or follow the podcast so that you can listen to other interviews where you know I get to talk and, and get to know the person again, beyond the page, beyond the creative work. Um, appreciate you listening. If no one's told you yet today, you're an absolute legend.